Welcome back to tinyhousesforall.com and the Tiny Houses for All YouTube channel. In the summer of 2014, my wife Carla and I decided that we were going to build out a bus into a tiny home. So we went off to find a bus. And this is what we found. We'd been doing some research and decided that the perfect size bus was a, actually a little bit in between the normal size of the buses you see today. Today, you generally see the huge 70 to 80 passenger buses, and you see the small uh, van buses that uh, only carry maybe 15, 20 people. What we were looking for was something in between, and they simply stopped making those kind of buses for the most part, except for specialty purposes, simply because uh, they, the need of the schools was to either have very, very small groups say for special education or for special tours, trips, and things like that, or to have these gigantic buses so they could, you know, haul them around like sardines in a tin can. And, and so they just stopped making these buses. But what you're looking at here is, is actually a uh, Chevy Carpenter combination bus. Now, there's several companies that made these kind of buses. They, uh, the Bluebird Company was famous for their Mini Bluebird or Mini Bird. And uh, this one happens to be a Chevy P32 delivery van front. It's not just a regular van, van, but it's a, a P32 Chevy van, a delivery van, and it has a carpenter body on the back. So this was actually built by carpenter using a Chevy uh, cab and chassis that they, that they had purchased. It was built in 1994. We found this one on Craigslist. It was in downtown Chicago. And uh, just to let you know, at the time, we were living in central Kansas, so it was not a huge obstacle, but it was a nice, hefty drive. And so uh, we went down to Chicago in the summer of 2014, as I said before, and purchased this uh, bus. It was actually in very, very good shape. It only had 128,000 miles on it, very good tires. Uh, it had, of course, been painted the, the color you see it. Uh, law prohibits you to have a yellow bus if it's not an official school bus and if you're not an official school, uh, security reasons and whatnot. So, uh, so it was as you see it there. Now we uh, we of course went and picked up the bus, and that's a whole another story uh, that I'll tell perhaps at some other time. On the way back, it was quite an adventure. We did replace an, an exhaust system. On the way back, uh, we replaced an alternator on the way back. We replaced a battery on the way back, among other things. But uh, we did get the bus back finally to, uh, to where we were going to work on it uh, on, our, on the little farm in uh, central Kansas. So that's really the bus kind of as you see it. Now, the bus was... Uh, uh, and this next picture, of course, is the bus after we had already outfitted the bus. And I'm going to show you some exterior shots of it just to kind of give you an overall feel for, for this bus. But it was about a 30 to 32 passenger bus and uh, much lower than the buses that you normally see, the big 70, 80 passenger buses, and perhaps just a little higher off the ground than your typical van build out on a, on a, on a uh, school bus. So uh, we're just going to kind of go around the bus and take a look at it. You see here we removed the extraneous mirrors, not, not obviously not the side mirrors that you look out of to drive, but the, but the front mirrors that were used for uh, carrying passengers. Uh, this bus had, was being used, uh, had been bought originally by a school system in Indiana and was being used by a Head Start and then had been sold just not too long ago uh, before we bought it. Uh, to a an organization that was doing inner city work, and then they decided, after they had several other uh, vans donated and purchased, that they really just didn't need this bus anymore, and it was uh, it was a drain on them. So that's when they sold it. We purchased this bus for twenty five hundred dollars. Twenty five hundred dollars. It's a nineteen ninety four. Uh, it was in excellent shape. There was not a cut on any of the seats. Not not a blemish on any of the seats in the van. No broken glass. Uh, there was a chip and a windshield, which we also ended up having to replace uh, in order to uh, pass inspection. So 
it was in great shape for 2500 bucks. So there are deals out there, especially Craigslist would be my number one choice. A lot of scammers on Craigslist, but other than that, a great choice as far as, uh, as far as getting your van. But we're just going to kind of circle around the van and, and again, kind of make note of a, of a few quick things. But one of the things that, uh, one of the things I want to point out is that by this time we had already done the roof work, caulked it in, made sure it was weather tight. And the roof, as you can see right here, is where we had done most of that work, of course. The roof, you can see, actually has four unisolar flexible panels on it. They're about 15 inches wide and about 18 foot long. So this bus turned out to be just perfect for what we needed. Uh, there's two panels running lengthways down each side in the middle. And every all the fixtures on the top of this bus were located right down a, a line down the middle. There's a strobe light, which worked, was kind of cool. It didn't really serve any purpose for us, but it was kind of neat. And you can see a hatch in the middle, the escape hatch. And in the front, right over the lights in the front, right over the, the driver and the cab, is a vent, an air vent. And so we were able to drill just one single hole uh, in the side of that vent, and we were able to run our solar lines, the solar collection lines from the panels that you can see, just you can just barely see one there on that, on that front uh, left panel. Uh, into there without having to do anything else, without having to cut any holes in the roof or anything. It was perfect. Now there was a little bit of difficulty laying these panels down over the rivets because as you can almost kind of see there on the, on the uh, um, they're more or less above the window uh, dividers. You can pretty much see where the rivets are because there's just a little bit of flex in the panel there. We sealed around that and, and really experienced uh, no problems uh, with that. So there's four 128 watt panels on there. So really, and each one in, in bright sunlight would actually produce maybe maybe 110. Solar panels never produce all the wattage that they rate them for. So total, we had about 440 watts of power uh, from the roof of this bus. So not not bad at all for a space that small. So. But as we go around and just kind of look at the bus, you can see, I don't know, buses and the word cute perhaps don't normally go together. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, I'd have to say, yeah, this bus is pretty cute. All right, as buses go. So it was a cute little tiny house. Uh, you can see right there around the escape hatch door. And usually when you buy a bus, you're going to find that this is your normally your major rust issue. And you can see there around the corners, the, the bottom, I had to redo the the seal at, uh, on the bottom of the floor and I had to do some body work on the bus right around that door. But other than that door, everything else on this bus was really pretty much weathered in. I did a little caulking around some of the chair rails as you can see the, the protective rails around the outside of the bus and that's about it. So a cute little bus. Now um, just one more shot here of the bus on, on, on the outside. I just wanted to point out one more thing here. If you count the, the passenger uh, windows there and you count back to the fifth window, there's seven in all on this side, six on the other. The, the, the fifth window is uh, actually completely sealed off. The window is still there, but it's been moved down and in its place uh, or in the opening, is a vent and that vent of course is for the uh, batteries the venting of the battery box passive venting of the battery box from the electrical system itself so that's you can kind of get an idea of where the electrical system is it's right over the over that left uh, wheel well over the left back wheels and just wanted to point that out the the other thing is that we put removable panels on the inside of all the windows that could be taken away or, or put back up as we saw fit and there they were uh, insulative panels and I'll show you how kind of how that works a little bit more as we go through the inside but they were blacked out on the outside so that it, it so that all the light would reflect off the windows we did that in in lieu of curtains because first of all we wanted a bus that looked pretty much just like a regular bus I mean a bus that that people would use for transportation 
rather than just advertising it as as a tiny house to to anyone that passed by it so we tried to make it as much um, in uh, discreet or disc, uh, discriminant as possible uh, in order to uh, in order to just blend in as much as you can blend in at a bus uh, so let's get on to some of the details now. I'm not going to go a whole lot into the engine here for those engine aficionados. I do apologize for that. But this, uh, I'm just going to show a little bit to show you what the engine was like, the, how the compartment was laid out, uh, just a few basics like that, uh, just, just for, I guess, for, for the record. So it's, uh, it basically is a large six-cylinder engine. It was in very good shape. There's a little rust here and there, a little rust on the major components. Uh, but uh, basically, the engine was in really, really good shape. The only problem that we had with it was it was a bit underpowered for, uh, we think, for, uh, for really probably originally for its purpose. Uh, so it did labor up hills a little bit. And, uh, and we were not sure if it was just an electronic governor. Several mechanics told us that it was, there was a black box governor on it and that we would never be able to go more than about 60 miles an hour. And that's about right. Uh, but even up the hills, usually it, it was going about 45, 40 to 45. So the other unique thing about it is, is that there were three heating systems in the bus. One was under the driver's seat. One was at the very rear underneath some of the passenger seats, which of course we removed uh, in order to do the bus build out. Uh, and the other one, uh, and you can see the big pipes here, the other one was right inside the door as the students would walk up the steps to get into the bus. And, um, and what this is, is the radiator system had been built out and maybe this is standard for a lot of buses, I don't know. But the radiator system had been built out to where it circulated radiator fluid, hot radiator fluid from the engine all the way through the bus and back again. And then it used electric fans from the bus's battery to drive that heat out into the bus. So that's the bus heating system, uh, which we actually turned off. We, we disassembled the part that went under the driver's seat and under the uh, passenger seat uh, in, inside the bus, inside the back of the bus, and uh, only had the heater up here in the front, okay? So I just kind of wanted to point that interesting part of the bus out. You can pause the video if you want to see the details on the bus here. This is the bus cab. Again, in excellent condition. Uh, there's really, there's really, the only thing wrong with the cab of the bus was, and you can see it right here, is a little crack on, on the uh, instrument panel there going across the right main instrument uh, cluster there. So other than that, very good shape. Uh, no problems there, really didn't have to do anything about it. You're, here you're looking out from the front of the bus over the heating system. Now right on the lower left there is actually an inside access to the engine. Okay, because the engine doesn't stick out very far in the front of this bus. The nose, as you could see on the delivery van front, is, is kind of a pug nose. It's kind of short. And so you actually are able to access the, uh, the uh, top of the transmission and the back of the engine in the middle from this middle lower panel here. And then on the right is the bus heater, as I was explaining before uh, when we were looking at the engine. So it's kind of an just kind of a neat old bus. Now, right here, I'm just going to show you a quick overview of the floor layout. And um, as we go through this, I'm just kind of I'll just kind of make uh, mention of things as it comes to mind. But the you can see that the front of the bus is on the right, and the rear of the bus is on the left. Okay, and this bus is about 16 and a half. Feet, well, the interior. The bus is actually a, a bit longer than that when you when you take into consideration the the bumper and the engine compartments and all of that. So, the bus is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 foot long. Uh, but the inside interior here is 16 and a half foot by uh, by about seven foot, and that's about 5.03 meters by 2.13 meters. If I've done the conversion correctly. Uh, being here in the U.S., of course, we use feet and inches. But um, 115 square feet, 10.7 square meters. So a nice compact little space. Now, 
in, in the way we had set this up was uh, to do our cooking outside uh, for the most part. And of course, we eat a lot raw. Uh, we eat a lot of raw food because uh, we are vegetarians. We're near vegan vegetarians. Sometimes we get a little cheese, sometimes uh, some eggs we use in, in baking or something like that. But for the most part, uh, we don't eat any meat. We, we are vegetarians. So we do the cooking that we would do for the most part would be outside. And uh, so this does not include uh, a whole build out of a cooking system. Uh, it does. It did have a kitchen sink, uh, a deep, nice deep sink, a refrigerator, and a water filter, things of that nature. So, uh, just kind of you can kind of see right there how it works. It also was uh, outfitted with a wet closet or a shower closet, and in that closet was basically the whole room was a a wet room. It had a drain in it. And inside it had, there was a porta potty and a small sink, and of course uh, a shower, and that's uh, the way we set that up. And then what we did was we used the wheel well space, which you could not stand up in. See, the nice thing about a bus over a lot of these vans is you can stand up. And my wife was absolutely adamant that she wanted to be able to stand up inside. Uh, our tiny house, which is probably a very reasonable thing. I'm glad we did it after uh, after the fact. I realized, you know, that makes a big difference in, in the feeling of home. Uh, if you can't stand up in your home, well, you know, that's uh, that's not a good thing. So, so we built the electrical closet and the water closet over the wheel wells because that space was really not usable in terms of standing up. So what we did was we used the bathroom in between because we had to have a, we wanted a small space for that anyway it needs to be next to the electrical and to the water so we have the lights and we have the uh, and we have the water so we just built it in between and then just made a little doorway and entryway from the main part of the bus in the front to the bedroom in the back and that's really kind of the the shape of the bus really uh, dictates how you how you lay these things out a lot of times and anyone who's done any kind of rehab versus new construction will tell you that it's a much more of a challenge to rehab something within a confined space, whether you're talking about a, a tiny house or, or a house in general, or you're talking about a vehicle, working and making things fit within a confined space is much more difficult than just designing a space from scratch and, and building it out you know, from the beginning. It's much more challenging. So, uh, but I'll go into some more of those details as we go through this. And uh, and you can see what we've what we had done here. Now, the the next thing that uh, we're going to do is just kind of go through the build out itself. Uh, right here, you can see that we have stripped the seats out. Basically, that's all that's happened here, except that I have laid a subfloor. Uh, you can also see the tint on the windshield up front, which is kind of neat. But this is a subfloor. What we did was we, when we, uh, when we looked at it after we got the seats out, it became very apparent uh, that it would be a lot of work for really no extensive gain to try to strip the old linoleum and all of that out. So what we decided to do was to lay down a, a heavy layer of, of adhesive, industrial adhesive, and then to lay the subfloor on top of that. So that's, that's what we did. We laid it around the wheel wells, and then we also cut it off as we reached the, uh, the bus driver area. So we, we didn't want to mess with taking the bus driver seat out. There just wasn't any point to that. So that's what you can see right there is just the subfloor that's been laid on which we were going to then lay, as you can see, the stacked up there, um, laminated wood uh, looking or, or imitation wood flooring. Here you can see that we have uh, ripped two by twos and built a, an inside frame starting with a chair rail uh, right below window level and also uh, going vertically and horizontally all the way down to, to the floor, which you can see the laminate floor is now already in place here. And I don't recommend this, but on the cheap, uh, we had some very, very heavy duty thick bubble wrap and we use that as insulation. 
there's probably a lot better choices to use as insulation. Uh, the the choices would have been more expensive for us because we already had this this thick bubble wrap. So we actually used a bubble wrap in order to insulate down below here, uh, keeping in mind that you know there are value ins uh, insulated value you're going to get from from an installation like this because it is a metal vehicle. Uh, you're not going to be able to do much insulation on the floor. Uh, that it, and the, and the you know think about a curved ceiling, which of course this has your bus, your typical bus curved ceiling. There's there are some limitations to your ability to uh, to insulate a, 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 an existing bus like this. So we went with the bubble wrap uh, as as opposed to foam board or as opposed to fiberglass insulation because that's what we had. So you can kind of see how that how that looks at this stage of the process. The uh, you can see the old linoleum is still on top of the uh, of the wheel wells, and of course here you're looking out the back of the bus, and uh, so the it, it's just a it's just a, a kind of an interesting experience building out a bus. If you if you've never done something like that, then uh, then if you ever get the chance to help somebody with it, uh, even if you're not going to jump into something like that yourself, by all means, uh, give them a hand because it's uh, it's just kind of a neat process. Now, as far as the panels on the inside, we decided to go completely with a washable, flexible panel that was, it, it's a type of panel that's used on the inside of bathroom stalls, or I should say bathroom stalls, perhaps I should say shower stalls. It's a uh, I forget now the actual name of the product, but it's it's a it's a inexpensive product that's available from uh, most of your big box uh, home improvement stores, and you can also see the right there uh, at cent top center right uh, is the uh, one of the escape latches on on the uh, one of the escape doors, and of course you have the escape hatch up above, which by the way it, it, we're really glad that we had that because it uh, it gave us the ability to put a, a fan up there or to eventually, we never got to that uh, point uh, where we were going to perhaps install a, an air conditioning unit, but still you have a, a place to put an attic type fan, which would have, uh, which would uh, make it a whole lot easier to circulate air through as opposed to just window fans and the like. So you can kind of see how that's coming together. This is the other side, of course, uh, with the build out and uh, there's a little bit longer view of, uh, of the work that we were doing. Now at this point you can see that we've started to build the uh, framework for the division uh, and essentially really I guess you could say that there were five rooms here. Uh, if you want to call each of the closets, the service closets rooms, there'd be five rooms. The front area, the the middle area which is three rooms the two closets and in the middle is the uh, is the wet closet the wet closet uh, ended up being on the order of about 36 by 40 42 inches uh, on the inside uh, measurement it gives you kind of an idea of, of the size of the space so definitely a, a true tiny house very tiny like I said only about 115 square feet and uh, so you can kind of see this is this is uh, this is probably the clearest one right here where you can see the the two little closets over the wheel wells taking shape, and of course this middle space in the middle front or foreground here is the uh, is the wet closet, and then in the back background there is the bedroom. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of, of where we're going with this at this point. Okay, and uh, now you can see looking back again at the bedroom that we've started to put in a platform we decided to put in a platform and this platform would support the queen size mattress and uh, the the mattress was uh, of course being queen size approximately uh, five to five and a half foot by six and a half foot and it would be turned so that the your head would be at the left there under those windows on the left and your feet would be down at the right and we did angle it down just a couple of inches to make sure that that uh, even if you weren't quite parked perfectly level in a perfectly level place that as long as you didn't you know you weren't too far off a level that your head was a little higher than your feet 
and then we placed um, a storage our built storage underneath that area so really for the width of the bus which is about seven feet on the inside and then about five and a half feet uh, front to back or or side to side I guess it, if you're going by how the the bed lays it was all storage up to about 18 19 inches high so there's tons of storage space uh, for for a tiny bus like this and you can also see here in the four center foreground that we have a uh, panel that we've already started to put in place for the walls of uh, of the structure so there you can kind of see another another view of the same thing so you can kind of see this taking shape and here i'm i'm jumping forward a little bit because i, I don't want this video to be excessively long but i i also want to be you know as thorough as i can be in in relaying you know the feel of what it was we were doing and, and some of the details as well so here you can see the doorway on the right that goes back there to that to the wet uh, closet and onto the bedroom and on the left here of course is the kitchen sink this we're looking at toward the rear of the bus here so we're looking on on the passenger side away from the driver's side of the bus so you can see a little bit of the kitchen now what I'm going to do is show uh, some things here about the kitchen uh, first and then we'll also be sh mixing in some later shots with the uh, with us living in the bus showing just some uh, shots with the bus actually being used uh, we also did make a cutaway for storage into the upper section of the uh, water closet uh, back behind the sink there in order to have a little bit more storage that was accessible from the kitchen area and the the water tank is actually below that and i'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along so this is the looking in the same area of the kitchen only now looking toward the front of the bus what we did was for insulated purposes uh, for colder weather was to have a, a double insulated a curtain that came across and separated the bus driver and and exit or steps part of the compartment from the living quarters of the bus and so it was a it was a black curtain on the front because we wanted it to absorb heat and to blend in with the rest of the of the uh, window blackouts that we that we used in lieu of curtains and those blackout panels and on this side it was a uh, a, a, a insulative uh, aluminum covered uh, reflective blanket so that's what you're seeing right there and of course you're seeing the left hand side of the same kitchen counter that you were looking at in the in the previous uh, previous video we did have cabinets all the way across the top over the kitchen sink area which is also what you're looking at again here and then on the opposite side toward our back uh, over the dining room table and the storage area there we had uh, small kitchen cabinets uh, along the curve of the of the uh, of the roof there and yes we did have to cut out the cabinets on the back of the cabinets at an angle in order to fit those in but you'll see glimpses of, of that as we go along this is a the refrigerator compartment uh, you what you can see there is that I've placed uh, as asbestos or actually not asbestos per se I mean it's like the old asbestos but it's the new rock board uh, stuff that you that you can use to help insulate uh, so I want I wanted that in there just in case there was any electrical issues, so you can kind of see uh, see what the cabinets look like. So the the build out really um, and the, okay here you can see some of the cabinets uh, that we used above. Now in this view I want to stop right here. The, these are of course some views with us with some food in there. The bananas look really really ripe but they're actually uh, perfectly fine on the inside. We used really ripe bananas to make our smoothies because they're more flavorful and you could get them for like 29 cents a pound in the local grocery store when they couldn't sell them to anybody else. You know most people won't buy a banana when it gets a brown spot on it uh, but actually if they if they haven't been damaged and they and they turn really dark they're actually more flavorful uh, a lot of people in other countries are much more aware of this than we Americans are but you can see right here uh, that there's an electrical outlet uh, there now you can also see a cord coming in because at that time I was working on some things in the bus and 
and uh, it it really the bus electrical system uh, was quite capable of doing a lot of things but when you're running power tools like a circular saw or something like that you definitely don't want to use uh, a, a small electrical system it's just not going to work because uh, this power surge is required to run a circular saw when it's under a load uh, pretty hefty so but you can see right behind the little orange power cord running in inside here that uh, there is an electrical outlet so we had actually wired up uh, two electrical outlets, one for the kitchen counter side and the other was on the other side for, uh, for use with our laptops and things like that uh, when we're sitting at the dining room table. Also what you'll see is that you can see one of our panels here. It's white on the inside, the window panel. Uh, it's over one at the very first window there on the passenger side of the bus. And it, we made it, it was insulated with foam, foam board and then on the outside uh, it was it was blacked out and this one's actually there's two actually there the one out of the window on the right hand side which allows you to take any one of these out and if you had to repair a window it'd be much easier to repair it by being able to take a panel out rather than having to to completely tear down something that was permanent and also you could slide it over in front of one of the other panels and leave it there so it was always right there handy you didn't have to have a, a place to store these they, the storage was right there next to the uh, the window that you were opening so it was kind of convenient in that in that sense so i just wanted to kind of to show you that and so the the bus build out uh, again is uh, is complete here and we're actually there you can see the refrigerator now in the compartment and the storage for pans right next to it and you can see the laminate flooring a little bit right there but the uh, the cabinets were just from a reuse at center and uh, my wife did a great job Carla did a great job of refinishing them and then we just made a countertop out of out of a, a nice pine board that we bought at the local uh, big box store and cut it to fit uh, so that was that's really the the uh, the program there so you can see the sink right there and here you can see to the right now you can see that we have a stand mounted I built a stand and we put our Berkey water filter there so that's that's what that is for those that don't know what a Berkey water filter is it's a large stainless steel um, gravity fed filter and here you can see the bottom of the stand I just wanted to stop and point this out because we tried to use every little available space here and so the the cabinet door there actually opens you can kind of see that I had to re make an adjustment to the stand so and and indent it a little bit and, and, and so I had to build it in several pieces, that left leg, so that the door would open over. And then it was just wide enough so the, so the kitchen drawers would open out in between the legs of the stand. So I just wanted to point out that, that when, you, when you are building in a tiny space like this, you have some real challenges. So there you can kind of see the whole thing. And just to the right of the Berkey, of course, is the entry into the wet closet. And uh, there you have our refrigerator door open so now this is interesting because and i and we will definitely do this again in our tiny house the the foundation permanent non-moving tiny house that we are planning to build and that is to use these uh, bright white lead light strips now the lead light strips come in all colors if you really want to if you want to get into the dance thing okay that that's fine they also come in a um and what would call a soft white which is more of a yellow white which is more reminiscent of your standard uh, incandescent bulb color okay and maybe it might be a little bit more like natural sunlight although I wouldn't say the lead lights are, are ever that much like sunlight but this is the white bright light which is more what you would put in an area that you wanted say the stainless steel look in a, in a kitchen or something like that but we really really like these strip lights they were super easy to install. Uh, they these work off a of DC, so you can work. You can use them off of your right directly off of your battery system without using a, a an inverter to invert the electricity from DC to AC. And AC being alternating current, DC direct current. Alternating current is what houses typically use. Uh, it's a much more dangerous current. You're much more likely to get electrocuted with AC, but AC can travel a long distance on a very thin, inexpensive line. DC 
only can travel a very short distance on very, very thick, heavy, expensive lines. And that's why the country and, and most countries of the world are using AC power uh, for their electric grids. But nevertheless, th these, uh, this is a, a wonderful lighting. You get uh, a lot of lead light for very little electricity. And that's usually the knock against uh, the knock against uh, uh, DC power and and particularly lead lights is that you don't get a whole lot, but but you you can do a lot with these lead lights and and they provide a lot a lot of light of the bus. The bus was extremely well lit, and uh, of course you can also see that they this you're actually looking here at the uh, at the dining area right straight across from the kitchen so you can also see the cabinets that we put across the really the entire length of the of the main room uh, on both sides was was had the small cabinets so we had quite a bit of storage there for such a small uh, tiny house bus okay so just wanted to kind of point that out and uh, you can see the top of a bus seat we used the bus seat actually two bu parts of two bus seats for the dining area so we did salvage two seats save them we sold the rest of the bus seats off and uh, and so that that was kind of a good deal this is the dining room table it's like the kit like the uh, kitchen uh, countertop we used a pine board and we just stained it made it look really nice and then i built a, a white ripped two by four or two excuse me two by two ripped board frame underneath it to stabilize it and uh, used uh, the bus seats without the legs on both sides what we did was we built benches to to uh, mount the bus cushions and uh, and the seat backing on one side to uh, to some benches that we built and we built storage in underneath those benches so you can see a little bit better here uh, if you look at the very lower left corner, you can see the edge of one bench, and that bench was a was without a back uh, due to space considerations. We did not have enough space for leg room under both sides of this table, behind the bus cab driver seat, all the way to uh, to this storage area. There just was not enough space for us to uh, to have the storage and to build the backs into. Uh, the seating area. So only this, the side here on on the on the right hand side, the lower right hand corner, you can see the edge of the back of this of the one bus seat, and on the other side, the bus seat was simply the bench to sit on. So it it is a very compact space. You can also see the panels, the outdoor panels are were in place there. Here you can see the panels been removed to let the sunlight in. Here again, you can see the uh, the bench seat but I did go ahead in order to have something to lean against on the back side where this bench is right below these cushions I went ahead and built a, uh, a vertical wall to separate that from the storage it also allowed us to stack the storage up a little higher and, and made a better use of the space for what we had and here again you can see one of the panels pulled back and you can see uh, the outside so you have the ability really anywhere you wanted to in the bus to open it up and allow for uh, the sunlight to come in if it's a nice sunny day outside. And of course you could close it up at night for complete privacy. Here you're looking again, that's the bench. You're looking straight down on the bench. The storage is to the left, the table is on the right. And of course we could store our dishes and, and all the accoutrements necessary for dining and, and what have you underneath these seats. Which of course is, is what we did. So we had a little bulletin board there. Now you can see, looking back toward the front of the bus, you can see clearly the bus uh, seats there on both sides, the space under the table. You can see we have our little uh, buddy heater out there. It was a little bit of a cool night, so we, we uh, had set it up so that while we're parked, we would, we would, uh, there was a little space that you between the uh, the doors of the bus the the folding opening doors of the bus that you could bring the line in from a propane tank so the propane tank is actually sitting outside the front door a little bit away from the bus and the heater is on the inside here so we were able to use one of these little uh, indoor rated uh, propane heaters and believe you me in, in a small space like that uh, you know 115 square feet 
maybe just a little less when you when you close it off with this uh, insulative curtain. The uh, it doesn't take much to heat it up. It really doesn't. It was very toasty inside with the buddy on low, let alone on high. And now you're looking the other way into the wet closet. So we're going to take a little bit of a tour here into the wet closet. Here you can see, now the wet closet was closed off on both sides uh, by an inside curtain. Uh, we did eventually build a an add-on to the door going into the bedroom particularly, which, would, uh, which was designed to fit over the doorway from the inside to help deflect water a little bit better. But you can see here the bus is lit, the wet closet in here in the bus is lit. Uh, by the light strips again the DC light strips inside and this is the mirror you had to, it wasn't a full length mirror but it was a good size mirror uh, inside covering that entire wall above the sink of the uh, and above the porta potty in the wet closet and you can see the shower head there so uh, it's like I said it was about a space of about 36 across the the length of this of this uh, cabinet countertop here. It's about 36 inches across and then uh, uh, back to front or side to side if you're looking in, if you're looking in terms of where the wheel wells are. One of the wheel wells is right down below behind this mirror. Okay, just to give you an idea. And we're standing in one door and looking at the other. So you can see the curtain from the close door on the lower left and the curtain going into the bedroom there on the right. And the, uh, so anyway, the uh, side to side measure is about 40. I didn't finish my sentence. The side measurement uh, for the uh, other measurement of the bathroom is about 40 to 42 inches. So it's a 30, basically 36 by 42. And you can, of course, see a bottle of Febreze there, the tiny house, tiny bus best friend, right? So the uh, bathroom's laid out. I'm going to kind of show you some angles here. Again, we're standing inside the same door. Looking down on the right hand side, underneath the countertop is open. Porta potty's there. We put the porta potty on a roller, and then when we're when you're traveling, you got to strap it down so it doesn't, you know, obviously roll around. And then right down, straight down on the on the lower right, you can of course see the wall, the back wall, uh, or the other wheel well wall on the right. Straight down, we put a drain. Now the drain's actually underneath this mat. We found an industrial mat at one of the big box stores in order to, to elevate your feet up off of the actual floor, and to allow it to drain. Now the uh, and you can see the sink right there on the left. It's just a little bar room sink. We picked it up from a reuse it center and uh, and uh, put the put the drains in. Now the draining system. What we did was we had the drains go down and uh, obviously we drilled holes to the floor to drain the uh, the sink and to drain the shower which you can't quite see the shower drain it's it's more or less there on your screen but it's kind of hard to see it through the holes of that mat and then of course we drilled a, a hole out the bottom floor of the bus in order to put the, the the coupling on to drain out the sink in the kitchen and then the idea was that you could hook up different things to the bottom of that coupling. Uh, you could drain it to whatever facility that you had. Now, the the thing about our bus is there were no exterior tanks. Okay, uh, yeah, you could you could you could haul the uh, uh, propane or something on the back, but there were essentially no built-in exterior tanks. There's no black water tank at all except in that porta potty that you're looking at right there. And so when you do that, it, you, you skirt around and really the, the regulations just don't apply that apply to the build out of RVs and things like that. So technically this was a metal camper on wheels, okay, uh, a metal tent on wheels, all right. So uh, by having the, the water inside and, and, and not having exterior storage tanks, which means, of course, you can't, you can use the porta potty obviously because you're going to empty it out at at at, at uh, stations wherever you're going, but uh, you you obviously could not use the sink or anything like that when the bus is moving because it would drain right out onto the the highway or out into the ground, but you but basically that it was designed to uh, to uh, not have to worry about all these regulations uh, that apply to all these systems. So really, it is a very very 
um, basic off-grid type of system where you have where the only thing that actually leaves the bus would be your gray water when you're stationary okay so uh, just kind of wanted to point out so that the porta potty there is on on a castered uh, wheel arrangement that I put together for that purpose so the so that's really kind of how the how the uh, drain system operates just one other thing about the wet closet is that uh, when we went to uh, try to find a base now you can see the shower uh, drain kind of shining up through there so you can kind of get an idea of what that looks like but when we went to get a base to because we just thought hey we'll go out and we'll find a shower base and that will be the floor of this wet room well first of all uh, we're building in a space that's already been dictated to us by the size of the bus pretty much and so we were we were going to have to look at getting a custom made shower base and regular shower bases are expensive enough as it is a uh, custom made shower base very very prohibitive so what we did was we framed with two by fours the uh the outside of this area okay and then what we did was we put in a double pond line pond uh, liner layer like a pond liner like you would use for a pond or that you might use for other uh, other lining purposes a big thick rubber layer and then what we did was we put our we we sealed around that of course and of course it had a lip on it all the way around and that actually became the basis for our uh, for our shower uh, basin so very very inexpensive instead of spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars okay on on a shower base uh, we spent maybe 20 bucks on pond liner because a, a pond liner comes in big rolls and it's not we actually had to go on to ebay to find a piece that was small pieces that were small enough to do this with because most people wanted to wanted to sell you like you know 10 foot by 15 foot or something like that so you can kind of see um, how that's laid out a little bit and then we put that heavy industrial mat over there uh, over that uh, pond liner so that and that was another reason for that so that we would not damage the pond liner with our feet uh, as the water was draining away here you're looking for the other way out of the wet closet into the main compartment you can see the buddy heater sitting there in the in the distance and the uh, and the reflective uh, insulative curtain and now we're going to talk about the bedroom a little bit now this is looking in through the back door the open back hatch door the escape door of the bus and looking at the platform and you can see it is kind of angled in this case you'll see it's angled slightly down to the left because your head's going to be their pillows are going to be on the right side your feet on the left and you can see the opening the door into the uh, into the wet closet now and that's right basically the bedroom is the size of a queen size bed it's just it was a little bit long or a little bit i should say wider longer in terms of the bed the length of the bed uh, but basically it's the size of a queen size bed now on the 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 curtain panel of course there you can see that the dark maroon panel is the curtain going into the into the wet closet the white panel on the right just to the right of that is on the other side of that is the sink and the porta potty and to the right of that you can see the open water closet and you can see the square loaf tank sitting on top of the wheel well there it's actually a frame built above the wheel well so that the that so the vibration wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, cause any damage or problems with that and then above the sure uh, the loaf tank uh, is uh, the open storage area which eventually we made a cut out which as you saw from the kitchen side went all the way to, over to the kitchen so we have storage on the right hand side and then on the left hand side at the at the at the left center you can see the electrical box now when you do uh, electrical systems solar electric you have to have a sealed box uh, where that is vented to the outside if you're using regular deep cell unsealed liquid batteries uh, using the the formulas that they use because when you are particularly when the batteries are in use uh, a gas is produced it's a hydrogen gas and it's and it's vented off by the batteries 
And of course, hydrogen is extremely volatile. So you have to vent it away because it's it's just like gasoline fumes. I mean, you if you had a spark or something, you could have a fire or even an explosion. And so uh, uh, batteries, normally you don't think about this because a battery is underneath the hood of a car and it's really open to the elements and it just it just vents with with the uh, movement of the vehicle and with the uh, all the all the uh, air that circulates through the engine compartment so nobody ever gives it much thought but uh, you do have to have a vented battery uh, system so we'll be looking at that in a little bit more detail i'm not going to i'm not going to show the entire solar system uh, breakdown here that's probably for other videos and another time uh, but but you'll get a, a just a general sense of of the battery system, and then of course we had the we actually had it triple sealed off from the rest of the electrical system because these batteries, uh, you're you've got a battery system here that produces hydrogen which could explode if there's an electric spark, and at the very time uh, same time of course batteries produce electricity, so you it's, you're it's kind of like storing your matches with your uh, with your gasoline. It's uh, it's one of those things where you have to build it right, or uh, or it's not a good thing. So you can kind of see that off to the left there, and above that, the dark area is a, another storage area, just like the dark area to the right is a storage over the water closet. So now, as we uh, as we're moving along here, you can see again. There's a little bit better. Uh, shot here, the the little round deal up at the top right is actually the water pump and we we ended up repositioning that later but uh, now you can kind of see a little bit better the water tank and you can see the storage space that is is over it and we we put a uh, uh, plywood sheeting over that in order to uh, be able to store things on the water tank and of course we had to put cutouts there and to fill this water tank eventually the plan was to bring in a line from that window that's behind the the vertical board there and so you could actually lower the window and there would be a hose right there and you could put the hose uh, from the outside into that hose and fill it right up but that's basically the uh, the water system uh, was comprised mainly of that tank okay and uh, and the and a little uh, sure flow pump now what you're looking at right here is actually the same view through the back escape door you can kind of see the shadow of my head there as i took this picture but this is the 18 to 19 inches underneath the bed platform so as i mentioned earlier under the bed was all storage and it's like i said about 19 inches high and then it was seven foot across looking left to right and then front to the wall there or back of the bus to the wall there uh, is about five and a half foot or about the size of the queen size bed so there's a huge amount of storage here as you can see you can get access to that storage from the uh from the wet closet through that shower and normally we would have if we were taking a shower you'd have a barrier there that a, a temporary barrier that we would pull out from this storage area and put there uh, to help make sure the water shed correctly and then uh, you have all this storage and then to the right there you can see uh, the panels there's a, a, a removable panel at the top right which is gives access to some of the uh, some of the piping for the water and then there uh, to the left you can see a little bit of the electrical right below the electrical box we have you can see the lights on you can see our hanging clothes now the hanging closet which is which is uh part of the bedroom here again due to space considerations uh what we did was we put the hanging space for the closet clothes at the very end of the bed so they literally hung over your feet so you could you could you could tuck your feet in underneath there and uh and uh under the covers and right above your feet is all this hanging space all right and then we had two lead light strips. You can see one of those a little bit across there. And then the other one was across the, the head end of the bed running uh, lengthways uh, along the, the roof of the bus. And again, that's it's a great thing, these lead light strips, because you can mount them pretty much anywhere to almost any type of material. And, uh, and of course, this is looking at it through the wet closet with the back curtain open. Now, 
in cooler weather, what we found, of course, is that we needed even a little bit more additional insulation to the panel. So behind here, this is actually a cor the back corner of the bus. And so on the left side, you can kind of see how it goes around a bend there. The left side is the back side of the bus where the windows are, uh, the side windows are. And then uh, the right side of this picture is the back window of the bus just to the left of the escape door. And there you can see the pillows on on the bed. And so the panels are in place. This is this is cold weather and the panels are in place. And then what we did is we got some additional insulation, a roll that we could unroll, and we just kind of put it up there and just and it, it pretty much, you know, a little maybe a little sticky tape and, and you're good to go. But it gave us a little bit of insulation. But you can also see the lead strip and you can see how light it is in there. So you can get a better idea of, of how well these lead strips light. Now, you can see my leg lying there in the uh, lower right as I'm laying back taking this picture. But this gives you a good idea. You can see right over my foot there is the entryway into the wet closet. And you can see on the left there are hanging clothes. And then there's a little bit of space there. You can see the dark entryway there into the, uh, into the storage space over the electrical box the the battery box and then of course the lead lighting system you can also see a little box up there that's actually a um, carbon monoxide detector and, and while I've got the chance and, and I'm thinking about it let me just mention that that we had one carbon monoxide detector and we had three fire detectors all within 115 square feet so on the right hand side of this door where you can't see it is a fire sm or smoke detector I should say and uh, then we had one over the electrical system, which is just on the other side in the main compartment. And then we had one over the uh, over the kitchen counter, so the kitchen sink area. Uh, should we ever decide to use any kind of a, a convection and uh, electrical oven or whatever there, we had something there as well. Plus, if there was anything that happened with the refrigerator, uh, then we would know about it. So you can't have too much protection. I should say that the we got the uh, smoke detectors basically for for just a, a few bucks from from a uh, garage sale. They'd never been opened. They were still in the plastic containers, and the carbon monoxide detectors, like maybe twenty bucks, is one of the cheapies. So you know, for for very few uh, for very few dollars you can have some very good protection i rec highly recommend that you regardless of what kind of high tiny house you have that you make sure that you spend just a few bucks and on and a few bucks more on some batteries and protect yourself okay now this is looking into the uh, electrical closet before some of the finish work was done but the inside of this closet you can see the, the lower left there is actually the battery box and then the battery box is sealed underneath that. Then on top of that is a, uh, is a platform that is a removable platform. And on top of that, you can see this uh, plywood column. That plywood column is the protector that actually slips out of there. And underneath is the venting tube. And it's very much just like a dryer venting tube that, that goes down into that sealed battery box. And then it vents out the window. If you'll remember from at the beginning of our video, we had a uh, uh, a black vent sticking out the side of the fifth panel back. That is that vent for for the for the battery box. Now this system right here actually operated on a combination of 24 volt and 12 volt. What I mean by that is the four unisolar 18 foot flexible panels on top or 24 volt they were wired in parallel to come in at 24 volt with the full 400 and or excuse me 440 or so watts of electricity and run they ran inside the bus ceiling behind the all those cabinets that we put you know, at, at the, along the rounded ceiling back to this room and in this room then, uh, and on an electrical panel in front of this room, which we're going to show you in just a moment, uh, it was converted by a uh, MPPT controller, which is a, a, an electronic controller that automatically uh, moves it down to 12 volts. And then we move that into 
the 12 volt battery system and then from then on the system ran on 12 volts from out of there now it gives you a lot of option with 24 volts you can run uh, more more powerful uh, systems off of that if you want to but most things run off a of 12 volt now the batteries themselves though are not 12 volt they're 6 volt so the 6 volt Trojan uh, T105 I think is the number of T150 uh, if I stand corrected on that uh, it's 105 or 150 uh, from memory that the those Trojan batteries uh, there were six of them and two clusters of two wired together six volts wired together as 12 volts and then the 12 volts were wired together in parallel so you had six volts in series two six volts in series making a 12 volt and then three sets of those to make uh, uh, in parallel to make a 12 volt uh, system and so there were six uh, trojan batteries uh, in this battery box and uh, and then an mppt controller uh, to operate that so really the the batteries were well sealed off from the electrical the rest of the electrical system which is on the front of the back panel there you can see that is the back side of the actual electrical control panel which we'll look at here in just a moment but I just wanted to kind of in brief uh, just mention the electrical systems there uh, that's kind of how we set it up now in here in the next picture you can kind of see the a bit of the electrical system on the front side of that panel on the front of the electrical closet which is just to the right of the, of the entryway there into into the wet closet okay so we had uh, we had the battery box was sealed and then the wires came through the battery box and that was sealed around the wires okay and then the wires came up through where you can see here through this rail that helped position them and keep them in position and then they came up on the other side of another panel another plywood panel uh, in, which has the electrical system mounted to it so the batteries really kind of are double sealed uh, in some respects triple sealed from the rest of the electrical system in order for in order to have safety also just to mention quickly when you do electrical system like this uh, it never hurts to go a little heavier on the wire rather than lighter. Heavy wires cost a lot because they're mainly copper, and copper tends to be rather expensive these days. But safety and efficiency on an electrical system is critical in a, on a small system like this. And so you always want to err on the side of safety. Small wires tend to be overloaded more easily. They heat up. They can be a fire hazard. You want good wiring. You want to spend the money on wiring. And just uh, off the top of my head, I'd say we probably spent about 3500 bucks on the electrical system. That was as much, really pretty much as much as we spent on the rest of the bus in entirety. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea. And people with tiny houses do experience this too. If you go with, my, if you go with a nice electrical system, you can easily spend about as much or almost as much as you spent on the rest of the of the tiny house depending on how good you are at scavenging for materials and things like that but here in this picture you can see the inverter it's an Ames inverter on the right you can see there's a little storage up there on the top right but anyway this is the electrical system you can kind of see pretty much the full thing here the Ames uh, inverters on the left is 2500 watt Ames inverter so it's quite capable of running most of the stuff that we would ever want to run. On the right-hand side is a uh, MPPT controller, okay? And right below that, they're kind of hard to see, but through the wiring, you can see there's a couple of fuses that are mounted. And also you can see there's a battery tender battery charger. And then in the lower right corner on the wall, you can, it's, it's a black, it looks black, it's actually dark blue is what they call a battery saver which helps keep uh, the uh, the uh, chemicals from uh, building up on your battery plates uh, the the sulfur from building up on your battery plates uh, and extends the life of your batteries because you're going to spend well, for those six trojan batteries you got a really good deal it was about 800 to 900 bucks and that's actually a pretty good deal for that particular battery and um then the lower very lower right corner you can see a little electronic readout 
that uh, comes with the MPPT controller. I'm trying for the life of me to remember off the top of my head what the brand name is on the controller, but it's a it's a very popular controller. That's a 45 amp version of it. You can get a 30, I think a 20 or 25, and then I think there's maybe a 60 or 65 version of it. But it's a it's a very good controller, very easy to use. Uh, and I, I won't go into more detail on that in this particular video. And then you can see a little bit more of a view there. Uh, there you can see the readout lit. And to the right there, now when you do set up these solar systems, you want to make sure you have breathing room for the panel. So what we did originally, we had a little writing desk type configuration that we set up there. We didn't end up using it for that. We ended up using it... Uh, as uh, as storage it was also intended to double as a storage space for a another refrigerator if we wanted to do that or if we wanted to have a smaller refrigerator instead of the bigger one it would it would hold a uh, one of those little cubes uh, or we could store a camp stove there uh, for use outside but bring it indoors if it, the weather was raining on it or something like that so that's kind of the way way we did it here you can see another version of this uh, but that's about, oh, it's about two and a half foot wide, that that area, with a little, with a little desk. And uh, down the lower left, you can see a little computer sitting there. And we were just using it for storage. Just to the right of that is the bench seat for uh, the, the back side of the dining area. And you can see the smoke detector at the top. So, uh, hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, and... Have a productive day.